Ba'imir. Okay. And uh, we're talking about the parades. That's the topic on the table at the moment. I want to start this class with a story. I heard the story from a man who was in Elma Emes. He's no longer alive. But he told the story to me about other people who are alive. So when I repeated the story, somebody went over to some other guy and said, you remember the story? And the guy denied it cold. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It means either he forgot or he just didn't want, didn't, didn't want to acknowledge it. There was a Jew in Montreal whose name was Rabbi Gringlas. Rabbi Nachem Zev HaLevi Gringlas. Rabbi Gringlas was a very, very chassidish He had a very good memory. He had a gavadaki idea. He knew tons of taira. And above all else, he was an unbelievably from man. He had Guvaldaki Yiddish man. He was extraordinarily from. And the Rebbe loved him. And he loved the Rebbe. Way before the Rebbe was Rebbe, from Poland yet, they had this unusual bond, the Rebbe and this Gringlas. Rabbi Gringlas. But the Rebbe's father passed away. Rabbi Gringlas wrote the Rebbe a letter of Nicham Avelim to console the Rebbe. He was a bachet. And the Rebbe wrote him a two-page letter explaining to him how the Friedrich Rebbe had given him four jobs, Kohos and Machnisol and Merkez and Chaber Kedisha, that correspond to the four letters of the Ebesh's name, Yud Kei Vovke, four Madreigs and Tchiyas HaMesim. Beautiful letter. He was, he was Mamesh Abbochet, he was still single. The Rebbe had a very special relationship with Rabbi Gringlas. There's a book about him that was published after he passed, uh, which he supposedly, supposedly edited it. So here's a story, he was Mashpia. The yeshiva. And he really was from a different generation. He was from Poland. And he, he knew the old Lubavitch and the old Tem Chetmim Bechlal. He was a Polish. He wasn't even a Lubavitch from home. He came to Lubavitch because he looked at Tem Chetmimim and he was sent by the Fidel Kebbe to Montreal in the middle of the war. He was, he was a Tomim. He was very close to the Rebbe. But he had a very hard time with all the modern stuff. It wasn't his thing. So when the Rebbe made parades... And the parades were done every time Lag Ba'imah was on a Sunday, there was a parade. There wasn't a Lag Ba'imah parade every year. They're making this year a Lag Ba'imah parade. I guess it's 120 years. But today's Lag Ba'imah parade, I think it's on a Thursday. Am I right? Yeah? They only make parades on Sunday. Why? Because the parades are not made for me and you. The parades are made for public school children who join either the release time program or the Masiba Shabbos program or both. And they want them to participate. They should be involved in something Yiddish, which has pride. It should be Jewish pride. This was the whole chap. Kids should walk in the street and demonstrate that they're proud to be Jewish. So the Lag Ba'ema parades took place every time Lag Ba'ema was on a Sunday. So, I mean, I was, I must have been seven years old. In 1973, I was seven years old, but I remember it. We were walking in the parade, it was pouring. And my friend says to me, the next Lag Ba'ema is in seven years. That means the next Lagba Emet when you're going to be 14. I said, what do you mean? There's Lagba Emet every year. He says, no, no, the next Lagba Emet is in seven years. He couldn't explain himself. What he's trying to say is the next time Lagba Emet is going to be on Sunday is in seven years. So the next time there's going to be a parade is going to be after Yor Bar Mitzvah. That parade the Rebbe did not attend, Lamed Gimel. But Lamed Vav, the Rebbe also made a surprise, which I'll get to a bit later, and he made a parade on a Tuesday. Ukafishi is by Lakama, I'll explain later. But whenever the parade was on Sunday, there was a parade. Now, the parade started out as simple affairs. They would call the kids together, they'd give them some food, they'd sing some songs, make some brachas, and march. But over the years, the parades got more fancy, more involved. They started making floats, they started to make signs. They, um, they did all kinds of... They, the, the marching band, you know, the Rebbe liked the marching band. The first time they had a marching band, the Rebbe asked they should go back a second time. When Eli Lipska made the first marching band, they had no idea how the Rebbe was going to react. They thought the Rebbe would be upset about it. And the Rebbe asked they should go a second time. By him, by the grandstand. Anything which would bring kids who were part of the world close to the Yiddish guy that Rebbe was in favor of. As long as there was the principle of Magad van Latay, they didn't change the Tater to suit them. You brought them closer to the Tater, but the Rebbe was not afraid of using what people would see as you know, worldly methods from a kind of people. So in Montreal, it must have been Yudzain, but I can't say for sure. 1957 was the parade on a Sunday, but there were others. And Eli Engel, who told me the story, all of us Shalom, was learning in Montreal in Yeshiva. No, 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 he was in 770. The Bachir of Montreal working on the parade. Gringlas was up, unhappy. Why was he unhappy? Because they took off time from Seder. 
So he wrote to the Rebbe a letter protesting the fact that the Bochum are not keeping Seder. And basically, the Rebbe tell the boys that they want to work on the prayers on their own time, but Seder is Seder, you have to learn. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm not trying to be a battle Seder, I just want to tell you this, mice. In those years, by Yabba Mehem, you're talking now almost 70 years ago, it was not uncommon for the Rebbe to walk out of his office, walk across the hall, go into the mosquitoes, and get the mail himself. The Rebbe didn't wait. People, when I was growing up, the Rebbe never left his room, unless he was going someplace official. But in those days, in the middle of the day, he would walk out of his room and go to the office and get the mail. A few times a day, the mail would come, and the Rebbe would pick up the mail. The Rebbe walks out of his room, goes across to the You know where the Rebbe's room is? You know where the Merkis is? How many steps? Four steps? Ten seconds? How many times did he walk the hall? Go into the Americas, pick up the mail, walk out of the Americas, and walk back to the room holding the mail. The Rebbe picks up the mail, shuffles through, pulls out one envelope, and as he's walking out of the Americas, back to his office, at full pace, in other words, with a few seconds, the Rebbe opens a letter, reads it, tears it up, and throws it in the garbage in the hall. Now girls, anybody who knows anything about the Rebbe knows that the number one rule about the Rebbe was discretion. What you shared with the Rebbe, no one knew. That's why people wrote to the Rebbe, because nobody heard. The Rebbe's secretaries, their number one requirement was not to speak. You open your mouth one time and you reveal a secret, you were fired. That the Rebbe should tear up a letter and put it in the garbage in a hole? Was such a violation of people's privacy? The minute the Rebbe's door is closed, the Bachem pounced on that garbage can. They pulled out, which is holy, the Rebbe touched it, and they put it back together. What was the letter? It was Greenglass's letter of protest that the Bochum were working on the parade. The Rebbe basically wanted the Bochum to see what he did. The Rebbe knew what's going to happen. The Rebbe knew that if he tears up a letter, puts it in the garbage, and the whole the Bochum, and I want to see what letter it is. The Rebbe was telling the Bochum indirectly how important the parade is. Verstehst? Greenglass campaign, and the Rebbe tore up the letter in a way that the Bochum should know that he, wasn't, he didn't agree with Rabbi Greenglass. The parade is very important. Now, the Rebbe was never in favor of wasting time and missing Seydeh Chas Shalom. But the Rebbe wanted people to have another parade. The most beautiful story is, Rabbi Greenglass was an old man. And whenever there was a parade, he would come around to the Bochum and say, give me a job. In the beginning, he was protesting it. But when he realized how important it was to the Rebbe, he wanted to be mishtamish, begufa. He would sit, the great Chazid Rabbi Greenglass would sit down on the floor and paint you know, these big banners, so the artists made the outlines, and then the yuklach used to paint. <laughs> Rabbi Greenglass, every parade, would come to the place where the Baruch would give me a job, and he would sit. He wanted to be Miss Asik Bagufa. You're talking about a very big chosid. Because he saw, how much the Rebbe cared about these parades. He would, he would come every parade, and he would mishtamish Bagufa in the parade. I have a friend who was probably in Montreal after Gimel Thomas. He's very artistic, he's a wonderful fr a friend. He's an acquaintance, not a friend, he's a little younger than I am, but he's a beautiful Jew. He's very artistic. He lived in Montreal and he made all the things. So one of the things that they did was they made caricatures of the famous animation characters with Miftayim. So they couldn't use Donald, they couldn't use Mickey Mouse because they never didn't want the trefer. But there's plenty of kosher ones, you know. There's Donald Duck and there is, uh, I don't know. They, all the kosher, I mean, I don't know how much you know about this, but you may know more about me than this. You know what animation means? Animation means cartoons. And cartoons are very big in America, at least they used to be. And a lot of the cartoons have animal characters that are kosher. So they took all the kosher animal characters and each one, I remember the first one they did it by the Rebbe. They put them on wheels, they made these wood cutouts, and the Echveis was, Donald Duck is wearing tefillin, and, and, the, and the Mrs. Duck is lighting candles, all the time. So they, did, so they did this in Montreal, and one of the characters is a ghost. But the ghost is white, he's plump and white, with like a little, like a yamak on his head, which symbolizing as a, that he's connected like an antenna lamaila. A famous animation character. But, Sabi Gringo shows up, and he gets very, very upset, he says, and is naked. He's naked. And the whole character is white. You know, he's a big, plump guy with small hands and small feet. I can't remember his name. And he's not wearing any clothes. He's a ghost. Ghost, naked. What kind of naked? And the beginning is very upset. Naked. So he tells the beginning, Rabbi, this is a ghost. It's just, 
You gotta put clothing on him. <laughs> so he, so he, my friend says to me that that, the forecast for that parade was it was supposed to pour. And by the Rebbe, there were Nisim Goyim. You know, you told the Rebbe about a rain and the rain stopped. And people used to write to them over the world, they're making a parade and it's raining and the rain would stop. In Crown Heights, there were times that the whole Brooklyn was pouring, the night was sunny until the parade was over and then the clouds would open up. It happened, Nisim with the Rebbe and rain are incredible. So he tells Levi, he says, Adivas the Munch Channel, Clay David Titanishan You put clothing on this ghost, it won't rain. So what did he do? He took from the pen, he made like this here. You know, just a, a, a one line. So now he's wearing a shirt, you understand? He, he was white. He was white, his shirt was just made an outline, it's a shirt. He says the sun came out. <laughs> the, 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 the forecast was wrong. What's the name of that ghost? Oh, I wish I could remember. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. He, he told me the name. Anyway, the Samaisen. So Greenglass saw Vifusig when the Mleben Negeya he was Poshet Mishtate Begufe. We from people don't appreciate how important it is. Because to us it's just a fun day. And it's supposed to be a fun day. But kids from not from homes, many of them, this is one of the most Jewish experiences in their entire life. And it's a happy experience and it's a proud experience, and it's a public experience. They're showing off that they're Jews. For them, this is huge. I mean, anybody who's been at a Hanukkah lighting, Hanukkah Menorah lighting, and people wander in, oh look, a Menorah, and you see their excitement. Their excitement is not that there's a Menorah, it's a Menorah in the street. These are Jews, and every Jew is walking around with looking over his shoulder. And they, they feel so proud that there's a minority in a public place. It's so big and so important. And as soon as the Rebbe got to this country, Ramesh, right away, one of the earliest things that Rebbe participated in was parades. He, or, it was Rebbe's idea. Kids should march in the street and say, I'm proud to be a Jew. It was very, very important. So like I said, the Rebbe had a parade every year that it was Sunday. And the simple facts are that, of course, over the years, the parades got bigger and bigger. And the Rebbe Sikh has got longer and longer. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. In the way back when, you can see the Sikh has never spoke five minutes. Short talks. He came out and spoke to the kids. The Ashley Yard and Mamish, I'm talking before the Rebbe was Rebbe. Have any of you ever seen pictures of 770 before it was built, before it was expanded? 770 used to be a house. On the Kingston side of 770, there was a driveway. But on the second floor, the first floor, real, the Rebbe's floor, there was a porch that ran the length of the house. A porch that ran the whole length of the house from Kingston till Union. Uh, maybe there was maybe a few steps down and up. It was a beautiful porch. The house was gorgeous. The Rebbe's office, the Rebbe's room, had a, right outside the Rebbe's room, there was a door that walked down onto a porch and you could walk till the back of the house. So the first few parades that they made, they gathered children and put them in the back of 770. In those years, before they built the, the, what they called the first shul, there was a driveway, which is now a slope that goes down into the main shul at Rabbi Groner's office. Remember that, right? That, by the way, the door that goes to Rabbi Groner's office used to be the entrance to the Viber shul. The, the door which goes to Rabbi Groner's office when I was growing up was, was still the entrance to the Bible show. Once upon a time, it was the only entrance to the Bible show. That's when women used to go into that doors and go up the steps, and the first show was right there. Then, of course, a lot of things changed. I mean, Gordon built his office, and so on and so forth. But way back when, that was the door to the Bible show. But before they built the show, the driveway went till the back of the house, and there was room to turn a car around, and there was a six-car garage. Six car, the big, seven of the big house. There was a big backyard, a big, like a, a cemented area behind the house. And they'd put up chairs, and the kids would gather. How many kids could you put in that backyard? A hundred? It wasn't massive, you know. It, was a, it, wasn't the size, it wasn't the size of this driveway. It was a backyard, a ha back of a house. And the kids would come, and they would sit. And uh, before the Rebbe was Rebbe, the Rebbe came and stood on the porch. And after the Rebbe was Rebbe, the Rebbe came and stood on the porch, and he would talk to the children, looking down at them from on top. Yud Gimel, 1953. And maybe you dialed, I'm not sure. There were one or two parades after the Rebbe was Rebbe, where the Rebbe came out, and he went to the back of 7 7. The kids sat on chairs, and he spoke to them in the back. Tafshin Yudzai, in 1957, is the first time they built the platform in the front of 770. So the kids, they, they probably closed the street. I mean, the parades were very successful. 
way back when, they would call up all the from schools. A lot of from, I had an uncle who was a big Litvak, who said when he worked in a school in New York, the whole school came to a parade. A lot of kids came to a parade. It was, it was an experience. Not just Freya Kindelach, but even from kids from all different kinds of school would come and participate in the parade. And of course, the, the highlight of the parade, what the Rebbe was really interested in, with the public school children. That's what the parade was for. The, the kids who were not getting a Jewish education, that was the Rebbe's most important target. They should have a Jewish experience. That was why the parades took place on Sunday. So there was a lot of kids. There was no room in the back of the house. So they moved it to the front. And um, they built in front, you know, this, this three steps going up to the deck, and then there's a few more steps going into the building. So they built right at the front, the steps going up, and a platform, a stage. And then they stood on the stage, and he spoke to the children. And the children, they, they stood or they sat in chairs on Eastern Parkway and the Rebbe spoke to them on a mic. There was a band. And then after the Rebbe spoke to the children, the children would march. Now girls, one of the most beautiful pieces of video of the Rebbe you'll ever watch is the Rebbe looking at the children marching. You have to understand, the Rebbe is not a man who wastes time. He doesn't waste any time. So almost always, when the Rebbe was out, he was acting. He was the performer. He was doing. And we were watching him. How many occasions were there where the Rebbe was out and he was watching us? It almost never happened. There are other occasions as well, which I've mentioned to in other classes, but the Lag Ba'ema Parade was the best example. The Rebbe would speak to the children, and in the early years, the whole speech was five, six minutes, ten minutes max. It's one page, short little sikhalach. And the Rebbe quoted Medrashim and Gemaras either about the Shimba Yechoi or about Rabbi Kiva, and he would learn different lessons. The Sikhas are all printed, you can see them, and many of them you can even hear the tape. And then the children would march. And the Rebbe would watch all the children march. And in the good parades, you're talking about a couple of hours, you're talking about thousands of kids. Thousands of kids! There were thousands of public school kids alone. Many schools came and all the children would march by with their mowers and with their Rebbe's. It was all organized. And the Rebbe would stand up on that stage and wave at the children. And look at the children and wave at the children. And they would, you ever see they blow kisses? It looks so natural. The Rebbe's blowing kisses at the little kids. Like this. You don't have to, the Rebbe is giving a child a kiss. The Rebbe is waving to the children, one hand, two hands. It's so beautiful. And the Rebbe is looking down at those children. And you look at the Rebbe's face, it was radiant. He's posh it shining. Because I, my feeling when, you wa when I watched it then and when I watch it now, is the Rebbe looks at each child and he sees Mashiach. Each kid, you know, in Medish it says, that Mashiach, kids, kids are called Mashiach. The Rebbe looks at each kid and says, this is not a kid, this is a God of Israel. This guy's going to be a of a thousand years. He looked at us with such hope and such optimism and such belief. I told you this, my father once told me, I will never have as high opinion of myself as the Rebbe had of me. And it wasn't unique. Everybody, when you were around the Rebbe, the Rebbe told you what you could be. And it was always more than you dreamed. When he's looking at those kids, you see all of that pride, all of that love, all of that promise. Now in the later years, so in the earlier years, the Rebbe stood like a general. Have you seen pictures of the Rebbe by the parades? Like a general standing, he looks gorgeous. And he would wave like this. <laughs> but uh, starting Mr. Ahmed Tafshin Mem, after the heart attack, the Rebbe leaves on the standard. Until Tafshin Mem, the Rebbe didn't leave, he stood. Upright, erect. Not just while he talked, but as the children marched by, the whole time the Rebbe stood straight up, waving at the children. So Mem, Tafshin Mem, the Rebbe would lean on the standard and wave. Mem Zayin, you could see, the parade was so long, the Rebbe was so tired. At the end of the parade, the Rebbe is literally doing this. His left hand is supporting his right hand. He pushed it, couldn't keep his hand. To, uh, the Rebbe was so tired. He stood away for two hours at people. Try it. <laughs> Try doing it. And you'd see the Rebbe push it, supporting his right hand with his left hand, and she continued waving at the kids. But those moments of this, <laughs> you know, Stop with the, like a kiss a little, to a two-year-old, to a three-year-old, to a four-year-old. The kids are walking by. Now, half the kids don't know what's going on. They're walking here, looking at the motor saying, We're going by the Rebbe! Look at the Rebbe! The kids are calling 
<laughs> but every once in a while you had a bright kid who, who knew what was flying and they turned. If they, you know, acknowledged the Rebbe, there, there was a meaning of the eye. There was a very, very special event. And this was really, to the Rebbe, I think, the highlight of the parade was the children marching. The talks in the early years were very short. As the years went on, they got longer and longer. Come in a minute side, the Rebbe could talk for two hours. And it was hot. And Yanka had to translate. <laughs> it took more time. And then the, then the kids would march. After the parade, after the parade, they would go to a park and they'd, have a, they'd feed them and there'd be some kind of a show, like a juggler, an acrobat, something, a show to make it entertaining. And there'd be a raffle and they'd give the kids all kinds of prizes. And I told you about this on Hanukkah. The Lubavitchers never won a single raffle. <laughs> all the bicycles went to the public school kids. The, 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 the raffles were fixed. <laughs> they gave you a bunch of tickets to give tickets. The cloud used to run around and he would motion to the guy on the stage. You know how these tickets have six numbers, right? But the first three numbers are the same. It's just three numbers, sometimes it's even two numbers. And he would whisper, this kid with the big long hair with the pom-pom, this is his numbers, they always want the prizes. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't understand why. <laughs> the Bible just never won the prizes. But anyway, the whole point was to attract these children. That was the point of the parade. But the beginning of the parade was to come to 770, and then I would come out, and would speak to the children, and then the children would march. There's another thing interesting about parades, is that the Rebbe was formally introduced, which is interesting. That was officially announced. Way back when, I think, in the early, early parades, Rabbi Hecht's older brother, J.J. Hecht had an older brother, who besides being a big chassid and a big shliach, was pushed a gon teider. His name was Shleim Zalman Hecht. He was the oldest of the Hecht brothers. He was son-in-law of Rabbi Yisrael Jacobson. There may be relatives in the room. He was the Rebbe Shliach to Chicago. He went to Chicago. He went to Shliach before the Fidika passed away. But a number of times he was brought from Chicago to New York and he was the MC. They say he was even a better speaker than Yankel. Deji Hecht was an incredible public speaker. They say Zalman was even, he would, and he, I heard a tape of him reading. There was a fixed text introducing the Rebbe. And they read the same thing each time. And it was moving. Yankel Hecht would read this paper. I don't know whether the Rebbe looked it over or not, but it was read before the Rebbe came out. And Yankel Hecht would read the text, and they would sing Animamen. Ani, the, 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 the band would play the high part of Animamen, and they would walk out the front door, and uh, Yankel Hecht would clap, he tells to clap. <laughs> he, he, he introduced the Rebbe, and now you have to clap. It was all very formal. And he would wave at the Hecht, clap! You know, he would tell us to clap. So we clapped. And then would walk out the front door, walk down the step, walk up the platform, walk over to the microphone, and then the music would stop. It was a very formal event. It was the only time when, when you might introducing the Rebbe. Uh, it doesn't just doesn't seem Rebbe needs an introduction. What? But this was a formal event, and each parade, Yankel Hecht would get up, and again, I think in the early years his brother did it. And he would read a prepared text. Beautiful. I wish I remembered. You can probably find it. I'm sure you can see it on the videos. Uh, he, would, he, would, he would explain who the Rebbe is the leader of world jewelry, and he would explain why. The leader of world jewelry, and then I would walk out. They would salute the policeman when he went by, and he would walk up on the stage. What's interesting is that the first couple of times, they had only one mic. So it's like kind of strange. The Rebbe speaks, then he steps to the side, and Yankel Hecht takes the mic, and the Rebbe's standing on the side, and he's actually reading the translation. You see this in Tashin Yudzayin, you see this in Tashin Chof, in Tashin Chavav. The first time they figured out that they could have two mics, could you imagine how much that money that cost, two whole mics in a parade, was Chavzayin. That means 1967 they had two, the Rebbe had a stand there, but Tal had two mics. But until then, J.J. Hecht Pashit shared the Rebbe's mic. So after the Rebbe finished speaking, he would step off to the side, and Yankel Hecht took the mic, and it was metallic. It shows you the Simpson Kipshute that we had. It was so big deal. There was a second mic. It was a big deal, a second mic. They finally figured out that you'd have two mics and the Rebbe doesn't have to move away from the standard. <laughs> anyway, so the first parade in front of 7 7 was Yud Zayin. And there's a video of it. The Rebbe comes out and he speaks to the children. And you also see how many kids came. The earlier years, they brought so many Fremde. Later years, it became more Lubavitch. More Lubavitch, first of all, in the sense it was more of our own children. And second of all, was the school, Lubavitcher schools in the, in the Tri-State area. In other words, they used to attract a lot of from kids from non-Chabad schools to join the parades and a lot of public school kids. In the later years, it was less and less. I don't know if you remember Tafshan Samach Beis. 
20 years ago, 100, uh, 100, uh, the Great Parade, they called it. They got over a thousand release time kids. Over a thousand. And it was considered such a hamtsaf. More than a thousand kids from public school came to that parade. In the early years, that was the whole parade, was the public school kids. But later on, the pub, the, 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 there's no Jews in Brooklyn anymore. Friar people who are Jewish don't live in Brooklyn. And those days lived all around. You just brought them in. So there was a lot, a lot of Friar kids there. And they used to come, like I said, they talked to the kids. And they would give them drinks and give them bread. They, they, they gave you drinks not because they want you to feel good, because they didn't want you to pass out, you understand. Uh, they, they were very happy. Did you ever notice, and if you went to day camp, at the end of day camp, every day they gave you an ISIS. And we thought the coolest thing in the world, because kids push it, get sunstroke. Kids went out of the park. They wanted to go home hydrated. Uh, give them water. You give them a bunch of kids water. They gave them ISIS, and the kids went home hydrated. It was, uh, so by the parades also, they made sure that the kids drank. In the early years, Lubavitch was small. But it was also very, very organized. The Rebbe was very personally involved. And my father told me, marry every person had a job. In those early parades, everybody had a job. In other words, even with white beards, you would go register in the office and they would give you a job. What was your job? Stand over here and tell the kids to sit or to stand. You would wash the kids until they die, you would help the kids with the brachas. Every the, the sense of inclusiveness in the work of the Rebbe that every member of Anash felt, I'm not talking about shluch, and I'm not talking about bachrim. You participated in the parade begufe. You participated physically in supporting whatever it was that the Rebbe was doing. So there was parades on Sunday. So there was a parade Yud Gimel, maybe Yud Dal, that was Yud Zayin. Tov Chof was a big parade. It was 200 years in the Baal Shem Tev. That was sort of the highlight. I think Chav Gimel was a parade, maybe Chav Dalid. I've never seen pictures of those parades. Then Chavav 66 was a parade. Chav Zayin was the year of the Yom Kippur, of the Sixth Day War was also a parade. Tov Lamed 1970 was a parade. Tov Shem Lamed Gimel 1973 was a parade. That's the one that I didn't come to. I'll get to it later. Tov Shem Lamed Vav was on a Tuesday. And the Rebbe made an exception and made a parade. for Nasa Chinuch. The year of Torah education. Tov Shem Lamed Vav was the year of Torah education. The Rebbe made the Yud Beit Pesukim. Marek Hazal was for that parade. Tov Shem Mem was again a parade. That was the biggest parade. The Rebbe wanted to parade. I'm going to go through this one by one. Mem Gimel was a parade. 83. Mem Dalet. 84. Then the next parade was Mem Zayin. 87. Then Mem Ches was in the middle of the week, and the Rebbe was an oval. And they wanted to make a parade for the Schuss of the Rebbetzin, and they asked the Rebbe to come out, and the Rebbe refused, they tried to threaten the Rebbe, the Rebbe said, Ki yudua, <laughs> Ein ich noim le teror. you don't give in to terror, the Rebbe didn't participate in the parade. And then Tav was a parade, 1990, and the parade Tav the Rebbe gave out a coin, a silver coin, a real silver coin, a minted silver coin, with the picture of 770 on one side, and the other side has like Vaimir, Hini Matav Manoim. Rabbi Krinsky has a story of how that happened in a very, very short amount of time. They minted 10,000 coins. Le, the Rebbe was going to give them out himself, but there was some kind of a miscommunication. And the Pearl, the Rebbe gave them out to the Tankist. So, what I want to do is, I want to go through um, certain of these uh, parades and focus on them specifically because of unusual things that occurred by these parades. Okay, that's what I want to do. In other words, one by, we'll go, I'm not going to go through all of them, a few of them. The, the, I described to you the idea of the parades. And again, the key, I am telling you that, of course, we came to hear the Rebbe, to see the Rebbe, but watching the Rebbe, look at those kids. And the Rebbe stayed as long as the kids marched. At some point, they introduced floats. Where they would rent these trucks and they'd put these beautiful three-dimensional images of mitzvahs and things like this. They didn't know how the Rebbe was going to react. They did all these things on their own. And the Rebbe loved the floats. The Rebbe loved the floats. And the floats were logistically situated. In other words, they would go by the Rebbe, not one after the other. They would, the, between the children, they put in a group of floats, and then a group of children, a float, and a group of children. And the Rebbe would look at the floats. And then, of course, they'd park the floats on Kingston Avenue, and a whole day you were able to see the Bachem and the girls worked incredibly hard on those floats. It was a tragedy at the end of the day. The guys had to leave the, the trucks, you know, the truck, the day was over. They would, in many cases, just destroy so much work, so much work, would be, blah, that they'd dump it all. Some years it would rain and they would get ruined, but the floats were something which was very, very dear to the Rebbe. I mentioned already the, uh, the marching band, that Eli Lipska made a marching band. He didn't know how the Rebbe was going to react. Eli was a Bachem. And he came to America, and he was very musical, so he made a marching band, and the Rebbe asked him to go by a second time. And then the government used to send him from the army, 
Yanko Goldstein, he was a he was a he was a chaplain in the army. Would bring from the United States military. They would come with uh, trucks and they would play. There was also an army band and they would blow trumpets. They would walk by the Rebbe. They would salute the Rebbe. Different groups of the army would come to show respect to the Rebbe. They would stop in front of the Rebbe and, and salute, and the Rebbe would salute back. These are some of the little details that made the parades beautiful. But it was the Rebbe and the kids. You know, there's one video where the Rebbe's parade is finished. And the Rebbe takes the mic. Yankel Hecht announced a thank you to all the people in the parade. The Rebbe takes the mic. Especially the ch- You saw this. Especially the children, the boys and the girls. The Rebbe, the Rebbe took in the parades. The Rebbe took in the parades. Okay, one more story before I go to the list that I have. The, the, when the Rebbe made a parade, after the parade, the Rebbe went to the oil. When the Rebbe went from the oil, Rabbi Hecht went to the Rebbe with the duch. Rabbi Hecht, Rabbi Hecht wasn't me and you. Rabbi Hecht walked in the door. He had an open door by the Rebbe. He would go into the Rebbe to, to give a report of the parade. And the Rebbe would make comments to him. And the Rebbe was not always happy. I remember once, it was clear that Rebbe was unhappy. Sometimes the Rebbe was critical. And if the Rebbe was not happy, you knew. And Rabbi Hecht was a nervous wreck. The Bechlau. He worked with the Rebbe, but... You want to make the Rebbe happy, and if the Rebbe is not happy, it's, it's bad. And if the Rebbe wasn't happy to pray, the Rebbe let you know. So there was a story once that the Rebbe wasn't happy with the parade. So the following year, this is a very famous moment, and there's a picture of it. At the end of the parade, before the Rebbe walked in, in other words, not at the end of the day when he went in for his duch, before the Rebbe walked in, the Rebbe puts his face in the Rebbe's face. And he says, the Rebbe is tzifriden, the Rebbe is happy. And the Rebbe says, hey, tzifriden, I'm very happy. And then the Rebbe says to Yankel Hecht, he had written into the Rebbe and complained to the Rebbe that he doesn't know how he's going to pull it off. The prayers were very expensive. And Rabbi Hecht had no money. He had no money. He was running a million things. Everything cost. Where did he have money from? The whole parade was a miracle. And he was very nervous. He was afraid about the money, and afraid about the organization, afraid about everything. Everything was on him. So the Rebbe says to him, The Rebbe says to him, after he asks the Rebbe, the Rebbe is tefridin and the Rebbe says, hey, the Rebbe is happy, the Rebbe is very happy. And then the Rebbe, what happened to you, Marosh Chayda? So he tells the Rebbe, the Rebbe is geschlapped. That was his reaction. The Rebbe schlapped me out of my mud, out of my schmutz. And the Rebbe says, Nicht, the Rebbe is geschlapped, ufgehoiben. It was mem zayin, yeah? It was mem zayin. And when the Rebbe does that, he makes it with his hand like this. There's a famous picture of the Rebbe, Rankel Hecht looking at the Rebbe's face and he got his hand up. That's this story. And the Hecht have it in their office in, J- in NCFGE. That, that picture hangs. Nicht ein Ufka, and they raise it. Ufka, I didn't schlep you out, I lifted you up. Nicht ein Ufka, he schlepped Ufka. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Another story with Jankel Hecht and the Rebbe is that um, he went in after the parade at the end of the day. Now the Rebbe came back, went to the parade, he went to the oil. In the evening, Rabbi Hecht, Sechina Levracha, would go into the Rebbe. So one year, the Rebbe told him like this. That when the Rebbe used to go to the oil, his car would go by the parade ground. So if they went to a certain park, Rabbi Krinsky would drive the Rebbe through the park, and the kids would see the Rebbe. They would want to see the children in the park. In the later years, they used to make a fair on Empire Boulevard. They would put up rides, and it was beautiful. They, do, they did a great job. A lot of money was invested Kids were very entertained. And the Rebbe would drive by. He would come down to, to Empire Boulevard and drive through the whole parade. And the kids would see the Rebbe in the car. They would wave to the kids. So after the parade, and the Rebbe came back from the oil, and Rabbi Hech went to the Rebbe at night, the Rebbe tells Rabbi Hech as follows. I was going by the parade, and there was a Ferris wheel, a ride, a Ferris wheel. And the problem with the Ferris wheel is that the kids have to get off, right? When it's, the kid on the bottom has to get off to some kid dangling on the top. And the Rebbe said, I look up and I see a child sitting on the top still. I know who he is. I saw that he was afraid. And as I look at him, he didn't see the Rebbe. That was in the car. He muttered, he was afraid. So the Rebbe said, the whole parade was worth it for that. The whole parade was worth it for that. The first the whole parade was worth it for that. Now I have another cute story, Alashan Haramaisa, okay? It's Alashan Haramaisa. 
There was a year that I knew, I didn't know him well. I knew him. His name was Tzemach Bartfield, all of a sudden. He died in the Empire Shtibel. He was like the, he was the big boss in the Empire Shtibel. He was a very interesting man, but he was very straight. He was too straight. Everything was straight. There was no chachmas with him. When Yankel Hach made a parade, so first of all, he always went into debt. And second of all, he, maybe, he probably didn't manage the money very efficiently. He was a bit of a bottle, so part of his problem was he probably didn't spend the money. Money was wasted, and he didn't even have it. So one year he wrote him to the Rebbe about the parade, and the Rebbe says, you're not making a parade this year. You haven't paid the debt for last year's parade. And the Rebbe's not let making a parade, which means the Rebbe's not going to come out, because Yankel Hecht owes money. So of course, Rabbi Hecht said, what do you mean? Forget my debt, the Rebbe's going to go out to the parade. So the Rebbe said, if you'll make a separate account, and you'll employ a separate person to manage the finances of the parade, so that it's separate from your budget, and the money that comes into the parade is going to be spent only on the parade. And, that, and, and, and it's, it's managed by somebody other than yourself. And you'll have enough money that you won't go into debt. I agree. So you need to find somebody who's close enough to Lababish to be able to do this. But Mr. Shani, he's the kind of guy that Yankel Hecht is not going to have a cup to put it into the pot. So they asked, Tzema, he was a businessman. He should manage the finances. And he's a very responsible person. And people send donations. Amongst the people who sent donations to the parade was the Lubavitch and Rebbe. The Rebbe sent a check. It was a lot of money. It wasn't $10. It was hundreds of dollars. It wasn't how much it was. He did such a good job that there was money left over. <laughs> now, what do you look for money? If it was anybody else, he put it in the pushka. He sent everybody back a check. Which means if you sent in $100, he sent you back 15 all the people who gave substantial amounts of money, he sent it, he said, the money was for the parade, this is surplus, then the tzaddik, which is, that if you want to know, Tzamech Bart was the Maise. So the Rebbe got a check back for a portion of the money that he donated for the parade. And the Rebbe says, what's this? So he told the Rebbe, surplus, we handed the money responsibly, and this is leftovers, so send it to you back. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe was delighted. I mean, that's how responsible it was. The Rebbe says, I didn't mean you have to be that. You want to send money back. <laughs> but that's the story. It's a, it's a, it's a sweet story. You're not going to hear this anyplace else. I, don't, I didn't hear it from him. I heard it from one of the people in the Empire Studio. It's a sweet little story. Anyway, but going through the various different parades. Um, and again, you must remember, I was born in 1965. The first parade that I remember is 1973. And the Rebbe didn't even participate in that parade. So the first time I was locked by him and prayed, the Rebbe was there was I was 10. It was 1976, Session Lama Dvov. But the stories that people tell about the various different parades in earlier years. So one of the most significant events that happened in the parade was Dosh Zayin, 1967. And this you could see on video. And you could feel it. You could push it, feel it. One of my teachers, one of my Rosh Hashivas, told me, he was a Bacha then. I think he was still a Bacha. He said, as soon as the Rebbe started to talk, we knew this is different. Remember, in those years, the Rebbe talked short. In my year, the Rebbe talked an hour. And then it had to be translated. Then he talked another hour. It had to be translated. But in the early years, the Rebbe talked very big kids. He was very sensitive to the children was waiting. It was 1967. 1967 was the year of the Six-Day War. Now, I was two. So I don't remember this. But you ask people who are a little older than I am. These people are 65, 70, 75. People were dead afraid. Before the Six-Day War, the Arabs were saying that they're going to push the Jews into the sea, and they would have done it. They would have killed every Jew in Israel, and the world would have said, oh, we feel very bad, and they would have make a special day of remembrance. But my God, it was a panic, and the whole Israel was up in arms. All the foreign exchange students were sent home. Anybody who's not Israeli left the country. The Lubavitchers were told by the Rabbi, are you crazy? You stay right where you are. And the Rebbe wrote a famous telegram, they should stay in yeshiva. And their parents were freaked out. And the Six-Day War. Six-Day War was, the, the, the Goyim called it biblical miracles. Miracles on the level of the Tanakh. It was Shaloy Apiteva Lagamre. So before the parade, it was, before the, the war, there was a huge panic. Everybody thought, they, they were planning... They, will, they, they went through the parks to find cemeteries for 30,000 men. That's how many dead they expected. There, was, there were dead people in the Six-Day War. We lost a few hundred. But 30,000, they were looking for the cemeteries. They were expecting terrible losses. It was Nissan. 
So like Boyim by the parades, which was a couple of weeks before, was Pashat B'chokaisi already. So the Rebbe did his regular thing. He spoke one sikha and a second sikha, both very short. And the Rebbe starts talking a third sikha. There's another zach. And you can hear the tone. I've watched that video maybe a hundred times. You hear the tone. There's another thing that I need to speak about. The Rebbe spoke in Yiddish. He says, an unzer, a ayer, a brider, an shvester, an eretz, Yisrael, an eretz, a kodesh. And they translated it in Yiddish. Your brothers is the holy, and as the Helika land. They find themselves now in a condition that for sure they're going to go out of it. And the Rebbe said, and what you could do is never miss an opportunity to do a mitzvah. And get your friends to do extra mitzvahs. There should be an extra shmid of a did next to And then we finish off the sikha by quoting the psukim from the parsha. But the Rebbe says it with so much power. It's so powerful. My, one of my teachers said, as soon as the Rebbe started to talk, they knew that this is different. Lapel, the Sixth Day War started, and it was over in a blink. Mom, in a blink. But this is one of those moments when I parade. Somebody told me that before the Six Day War, the Rebbe was called the Lubavitcher Rebbe. After the Six Day War, he was called the Rebbe. Can I tell you one more story? I got two minutes. I'll tell you I'll tell two more minutes. Amor in the Kamaisa. There was a Yiddin Kwan Haitha's name was Yosel Machkin. Yosel Machkin. Yosel Machkin lived next door to the Empire Shtibul on Empire Boulevard. He has three daughters, Yosel Machkin. He's the oldest of the Machkin brothers. He left Russia in the late 60s. He was past 50. He wasn't thinking to get married. The Rebbe told him and his older brother, Mullah, to get married and promised them that they would have children. And the, the, you know the Bey Shmuel Shul carries the name of Shmuel Machkin. Shmuel is older than Yossel. Yossel was the second to the oldest. They came from Russia when they were in their 50s. The Rebbe told them both to get married. They both had mishpachas. Yossel Machkin was a tough man. He, was, he had a beautiful heart. He gave tzedak on a I mean, he Don't ask. But he was a tough man. And he went through very hard times in Russia. He sat in Siberia. I mean, he did a lot of things that you don't need to know about, okay? He was a tough man. He got married right before the Six Day War. He was living in New York. According to Allah, a man who gets married for the first 12 months is not allowed to do anything. Knock a year, Lebesi. So he wrote the Rebbe a letter. It was Monday morning. The war started on Monday or Tuesday morning. That if the Rebbe gives him permission, He's going to at Yisrael and he's going to kill Arabs by Kharbi Abakashti. wrote to the Rebbe. Anyway, the Rebbe doesn't answer him. Doesn't answer. Friday night he comes to Shul and just five days later, but the war's over. And the Rebbe looks and sees him. And the Rebbe gave him a smile, a million dollar smile. He says his relationship to, with the Rebbe from then on forever was different. When a man says, I'm going to risk my life for a fellow Jew, he says, the Rebbe, from that moment on, his relationship with the Rebbe was on this, was different. Okay, I'll see you when I see you.